Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our first ever global Facebook Live in partnership with HMP Global and Wound Care today. Um, we are well aware of how busy you all are, so it means a great deal that um, you've chosen to spend this precious time with us tonight and this afternoon, depending on where you're watching. Um, this is the first of three events, so um, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you join us on this journey in the weeks and the months ahead when it comes to MASD. Um, tonight's event is called Recognising Moisture Skin Damage, and our two amazing speakers are with me now, so Marianne Obst and Lakshmi Dumu. Um, good afternoon, Marianne. Good evening, Lakshmi. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ed. You both well? Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you so much for your support tonight. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, they're both delivering this event remotely. So if we have a technology problem, please bear with me. And I promise you'll get it sorted out as soon as possible. Um, the link for the certificate of attendance will be made available towards the end of tonight's event. That will count towards your revalidation portfolio, your CPD. So make sure you download that. All the slides are available for download. Um, these will go up on our website. Hopefully the website will pop up at some stage in the comments bar. But woundcare today, um, woundcare-today.com. Um, they're there for download. We're also translating them to six different languages so they can be shared with your colleagues all around the world. Um, as both speakers tonight will concur, the more involved, um, the more engaged you are, the better it is for the event. So leave comments, um, let us know where you're watching from, but also ask questions, um, and we will endeavour to answer as many of them as we possibly can towards the end of tonight's event. Um, before we start, um, a massive thank you to our partners tonight, to our 3M. Um, it takes real courage to support something new, and this feels very new. Um, without your belief, passion, and commitment towards independent education, these events simply could not and would not happen. So a massive thank you from my team at Wincare today and also the team at HMP. Um, it's hugely appreciated. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's first speaker. So over to you, Luxme. Thank you, Ed, and good evening, gentlemen and ladies, and welcome to this first session of MASD, Moisture Associated Skin Damage. I'm Luxme Dunmoon, nurse consultant from London, United Kingdom, and I just wanted to um, share today some of our experiences of moisture associated skin damage. And to start, let's look at some objectives of the session tonight. So the learning objectives of tonight that we propose is to refresh your understanding of the structure and function of the skin, which is really important so we understand why MASD and how can it be managed. This will then help with better understanding of how moisture and wetness can disrupt the barrier function and then lead to skin damage. And finally, we will work through the four clinical manifestation that comprise moisture-associated skin damage, some of which you may have seen in your clinical practice. So in order to better understand how moisture or wetness can damage the skin, it's really important that we start from the beginning because we all know that skin is the largest organ of the body. And we also know that it performs a number of key functions that are vital to the overall health and well-being. So the skin is part of an integumentary system. It's the largest organ of the body, including the epidermal appendages, hair, nails, sebaceous, and sweat glands. It is complex, but an amazing structure. However, it's often taken for granted until it is damaged. So this is your layer of your skin, and in every person, it's the same layers. But yes, the consistency might be different. So let's start with the skin and its layers. The normal skin layers, which is epidermis dermis, it is divided by the basement membrane and also as the dermal epidermal junction. It is a semi-permeable membrane that regulates the transfer of protein and other materials, such as oxygen and nutrients across the dermal epidermal junction. The basement membrane acts as a mechanical support for the epidermis. And just below the dermis, as you can see, it's the subcutaneous layer or hypodermis, as we call it, which is made of adipose tissue and connective tissues. So to understand how moisture can damage the skin, 
it's really important to refresh the structure and function. And this is why lowering your layers of the skin, it's very important. So now let's have a look at the dermis. The epidermis, as you can see, it helps us to visualize the five layers here. On the right, of the right hand side of the diagram, each of the five layers are named. On the left hand side of the diagram, the key cell types highlighted play a special role with the function of the epidermis. As you can see, the outer layer, which is the stratum corneum, is the most important layer in maintaining the pH dependent barrier function of the skin. And this is also essential for preventing infection and minimizing water loss. And throughout our presentation today, you will hear the word stratum corneum. Keratinocyte is the predominant cell of the epidermis, which produces keratin and forms the epidermal water barrier. It is also the layer that sheds up to one gram of cells daily, depending on the amount of applied mechanical forces that occurs as a result of daily activity. And then you've got the Langerhans cells, which are found in the spinosome layer and are reactive lymphocytes that respond to an antigen. You then find the Merkel cells. They are found in the basal layer. These cells are thought to be the touch receptors. And in this layer, you also have the melanocytes. These cells, they synthesis melanin and are mainly responsible for skin tones. And they also play a role in protection from the skin damage, from damages effect of radiation on the skin. It is very important for us clinicians to understand the epidermis layers and function as this will help with better understanding how we manage moisture damage. And as I mentioned earlier, stratum corneum, which is part of the epidermis, it's the most important layer that you know, it protects. So the, it is known as the horny layer. You've got corneocytes, also known as dead keratinocytes. These dead the death of these cells is a natural process, and they allow the formation of dead cell layers of keratinocytes, which then create a physical barrier for the skin. They comprise of 15 to 20 layers, which are full of cornified keratinocytes. The corneocytes embedded in the intercellular lipids are often described as bricks and mortar where the bricks are the corneocytes and the intercellular lipids are the mortar. Corneocytes contain a natural moistening factor which provides hydration for effective skin function. The size of the corneocytes and the composition of the lipids impact regeneration properties of the skin, which is important when considering which skin barrier products are formulated with lipids like those found in healthy stratum corneum to reduce skin dryness and restore the lipid matrix. But also remember exposure to urine and or feces and repeated washing with an alkaline soap will change the pH of the skin and eventually break down the intracellular lipid layer, which is the mortar, and the natural moisturizing factor with the corneocyte, a cascading event which then breaks down that barrier within the stratum corneum, making it more vulnerable to damage. And now let's look at the dermis. As you can see, the, the dermis has been described as the factory of the skin. It is into two layers, a papillary and a reticular. The dermis is thicker, is deeper, it also consists of fibrous protein, collagen, and elastin, providing strength and elasticity. We have hair follicles, sebaceous and apocrine, apocrine and acrine glands, blood vessels, and nerves found in the dermis layer. Whereas the hypodermis is the thickest layer and composed of adipose connective tissue, blood vessels, and nerve. The important role of hypodermis is regulating the temperature as it acts as a shock absorber. What are the skin function? And I'm sure this is no news to you because we all know being the largest organ, skin function, the main one is protection. How does it protect? So the skin produces melanin, which is responsible for skin coloring, 
protection against UV light, ultraviolet light, and the skin also forms a barrier against trauma, protecting the internal tissues and structures from damage. And the next skin function is the sensory perception, where the nerve endings respond to pain, temperature, vibration, and touch. The next function of the skin is known as temperature regulation, where you get vasodilation to cool the body or vasoconstriction to retain heat along with the production of sweat. And the fourth one is production of vitamin D, which regulates the calcium and phosphate supplies and in body fluids. The fifth one is the main function of the skin to provide a protective barrier. And this, it depends on amount of sebum produced, the epidermis hydration, the transepidermal loss of water, and the pH of the skin. The pH is maintained at a between four to six, slightly acidic, and that's what we call the acid mantle. There are numerous factors that affect the pH of the skin, such as anatomical site, the soaps that we use, any cosmetic products, urine, fecal matter on the skin, but remember, you may also consider factors affecting the skin pH, such as age and ethnic differences. So it's really important to make sure that when we are looking at the skin, we're considering all that to make sure we're not disrupting the skin barrier function. Now let's discuss the damage that moisture or wetness, as you can call it, can have on the skin surface. This has a significant role in damaging the skin barrier function, particularly from urine, feces, or wound exudate. The water element draws into the corneocytes and is retained, then leads to disruption of the structure of the stratum corneum, if you remember what I said. This then contributes to the swelling at the skin surface, and as a result, Moisture-associated skin damage arises when moisture disrupts the skin barrier function of the stratum corneum, which then leads to the common clinical manifestation, which we will discuss next. In summary, you have now refreshed your knowledge of the structure and function of the skin, the importance of the skin barrier, and the damage moisture plays at the skin surface. But what is MASD, moisture-associated skin damage? Let's now look at the, most, the four most common types of MASD. MASD is an umbrella term used for, to describe the next clinical manifestation. And it's actually incontinence-associated dermatitis, IAD, intertriginous dermatitis, which also known as endotriga, periwound moisture associated dermatitis, which you will very often get on the periwound where exudate is not well contained in a dressing, or peristomal moisture associated dermatitis for people with stomas, which we're going to cover in this presentation. The differences between the four conditions is the type of moisture that induces the skin damage. And this has been differentiated by research and expert di uh, discussion in recent years. The difference between the four conditions is there is no age barrier. If the skin is exposed to excessive moisture, it doesn't matter how young or how old the person is, there can be potential for MASD. Hence, clinicians like myself, we should always focus on and understand all four types in order to manage it properly. Because remember, this can cause both physical and mental distress to our patient from pain, discomfort, and the impact on their body image. Let's look at incontinence-associated dermatitis, very commonly known as moisture lesion. And it's very often, it's not identified properly, but if it gets missed, this is where it can deteriorate very rapidly to pressure damage. Hence, the identification and management is very important for this. I'm sure you've seen this picture, you recognize um, this condition, and I'm sure you have seen a patient in your career with that condition. So IAD, which is incontinence-associated dermatitis, 
describe the skin damage in association with exposure to urine or feces or a combination of these in adults. And we know it affects the quality of life and well-being of the patient, and it also causes significant pain and discomfort. We also know that for all clinicians, identifying those at risk of incontinence is basically being taking the preventative measure, it's best practice. Any individuals with incontinence has a higher risk of IAD. And this has been seen very often when inappropriate skin barrier or cleansing regime, for example, massaging the skin or rubbing inappropriately the skin. So it's really important to know the distribution of affected skin is variable depending on where it is. And identifying those at risk is very important. Understanding IAD, incontinence-associated dermatitis, independently of other wound types is very important as it helps to differentiate of pressure and ulcers often found within the same anatomical location. Hence, identifying patient at risk or those who have a causal factors, for example, urine incontinence, fecal incontinence, the elderly, patient on support feeding or patient with urine um, or fecal incontinence where the skin pH will change from acidic to alkaline. We know in the presence of urine, the skin changes from acidic to alkaline, but we also know that liquid stool has a number of enzymes and those enzymes break down, increasing the pH. This is the reason why people with double incontinence are more at risk because the pH is increased further because of the corrosive enzymes. So the greatest challenge is to differentiate IAD to pressure ulcers. But in recent times, there are many publications to help clinicians work through these challenges and gathering information like history taking, symptoms, observation, descriptors of the, six, of the skin surface, erosion, erythema, satellite lesions, and sometimes even infection like fungal infection. So to manage this and prevent this from happening, we have to consider manage the cause, which is the incontinence. Could be referring to your specialist nurses or um, using indwelling catheters or fecal management system or correcting the pH of the skin using appropriate barrier skin products. And remember, your patients are five times more likely to de develop a pressure ulcer if you do not manage the IAD properly. So the main location that you will find incontinence associated dermatitis, as you can see on the screen, is mostly around the sacral area, the groin, the perianal area. And this will help clinicians to actually describe and define the area comparing from pressure ulcers. Let's look at the cause and direct factors of IAD. We know exposure time, so leaving a patient or service users for prolonged period on a wet pad is actually not good. The frequency of volume not using the right pad to manage the incontinence, that can also cause it. Poor skin conditions, critical illness, low oxygen saturation, so you all get like sometimes medication induced a patient with in antibiotics, for example, that can introduce fecal incontinence. So anything that you can see direct or indirect risk factors for IAD, for example, malnutrition, is there an infrequent inadequate intake of fluid or is the patient on any specific feed that inducing the incontinence? Are they on any medication, as I said, antibiotics or immunosuppressant? Is, are we washing the skin too often? What are we using to wash the skin? Are we using occlusive containment product? Are we using inappropriate irritant to wash the, the skin? And in the UK, we use the acronym S-Skin Bundle, which is a national validate tool. And in the S-Skin Bundle, the I incorporates incontinence. So as a clinician, depending on where, irrespective of where you are, incontinence should be part of your holistic assessment. And by using a holistic assessment, you can identify how high risk your patient is, remove these causative factors and act early. Now let's look at the GAN global IAD categorization. 
This was published in 2018 and it's a, um, in 2017, excuse me. And it is a key to the categorization of skin damage and infection of IED in adults. Uh, most clinical practice has adopted that categorization tool because it helps us to identify at which stage the IED is. There are two categories of practice, persistent redness, which is under one, and skin loss, which is number two. As you can see, the 1A is persistent redness without any clinical signs of infection, whereas the 1B is the persistent redness with clinical infection, whereas 2A is skin loss without clinical signs of infection, and 2B is skin loss with clinical signs of infection. And if you need to check for fungal infection, follow your local protocol, but sometimes swabbing it will give you an idea whether there's fungal infection in there. There is an important tool to consider when you're checking for IAD if you're not sure. This is an, a very important tool to guide us clinicians on how to use it. So looking at the picture that's on your screen now, just want to ask what I've just said about the 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. What do you think the answer will be? Maybe a good idea to put it in your chat if you know what the answer is. But well, I can tell you from my area, from my point of view, where I'm looking at it, it's definitely a 2B. What do we think this category of IAD is if we think about the Ghent IAD categorization tool again? You got a satellite lesion with excoriation, vesicles, you've got small blisters and you've got erosions. Skin appears dry and flaky. That's again your 2B. And if we look at this category of IAD, we got persistent redness with clinical signs infection and denudation and excoriation. So this is the reason why using a validated tool, it just helps you to put into perspective what you're actually seeing in front of you to what actually you are documenting. And now let's look at intertriginous dermatitis, as I said, very commonly known as intertrigo. Common inflammatory skin disorder that occurs in, within skin-to-skin -skin friction and mainly in skin folds. We know the UK has a growing weight problem and we also know that individuals to this category have higher risk of developing localized inflammation of the skin. Hence, it's very important for us clinicians to know What's the differentiation of the different MAST clinic uh, manifestation? Because if you identify intertrigo early, you can manage it safely. So intertrigo, it happens when there's localized inflammation of the skin in skin folds due to minimum air circulation, when the sweat is not able to evaporate. And remember the stratum corneum, this then becomes overly hydrated, macerated, facilitating friction damage that is often mirrored and on both sides of the fall. And obviously, as you can see, it can be complicated by secondary infection, for example, fungal infection as well. How do we address this problem? Again, a holistic approach. Don't just look for the patient, you know, as in the hole in the patient, but look at the patient as a whole. Check the skin folds, check every skin folds to make sure your patient, your service user are not at risk of intertrigo. And obviously use appropriate proactive measures instead of being reactive to prevent any detrimental effects on the individual. Where can intertrigo happen? If you look at the common body sites, it can occur anywhere in the body where two skin surfaces are in close contact. Do not forget you're between the toes in the digital regions be it on the feet or the hands, in the natural large skin folds, and also under the axilla and the abdominal fold, behind the knees, under the breasts, in the neck, and the upper legs, especially if there's skin folds. So very important to check thoroughly all these areas and implement appropriate measures. Identifying high-risk adults. So it's strongly associated, as we said, with obesity, and those with skin care dependency. We've got loads of risk factors of patients with diabetes mellitus, for example, they've got a higher pH in their skin and also immobility. 
So others include urinary and fecal incontinence, people wearing tight or restrictive clothing or shoes, particularly using synthetic materials. But don't forget, we've got a newer group that are very high risk of developing into Trigo. They are the post-bariatric patients who have undergone significant weight loss, but have been left with large amount of excess skin and extreme skin folds, which may require skin surgery. And these patients are also at risk. So it's really important to identify and classify these um, into trigger early. As I said, early detection is key. Conduct your holistic assessment. There's no formal standardized risk assessment tool for intertrigo in use currently, but use your holistic assessment to actually check the patient, the person themselves, head to toe. The diagnosis is dependent on the risk factors, which we've just looked at. It usually starts with redness, inflammation, but likely to develop with, to fungal infection. So classical uh, clinical signs include mirror image erythema in the skin folds, and sometimes accompanied by sensations of itching, stinging, and burning. I will now hand over to my colleague, Marianne Obbs, who will talk to you about periwin moisture and peristomal. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. That was an amazing review, as always, and you always break everything down and make it seem so simple. So I appreciate your lecture so very much. I'm going to focus on peri wound moisture associated dermatitis. And this um, is this first statement really took um, a really good amount of time to think about. And, and I realized that it means so much to me in my practice. And it says that it's important, but sometimes overlooked area that despite the impact on wound bed preparation, it also it packs wound healing. So in my practice, I've tried to take a step back and instead of looking directly at the wound bed and starting my mental plan for the patient, I really look at the peri wound skin. So if we use this picture as an example of that, we are we cut the picture so that we can see the wound bed itself, but what are we missing? We're missing the peri wound skin. We have a couple centimeters, but this patient could have peri wound issues all the way up to his or her knee or even further than that. And so I think this is a good representation of the fact that peri wound skin um, needs to be documented and examined very well. Unfortunately, there's some confusion over the definition as there's really no clear definition of that. And it's, it's really difficult to quantify an area that you don't know where it starts or ends. And so I'm gonna kind of take a little bit of a deep dive into the peri wound skin and why it is so important as um, a wound care provider to understand and to treat it as well as your wound itself. The peri wound damage that um, Dr. Wu and Fletcher both discuss in their article is delayed healing if you have peri wound damage, delay in um, or increased wound size and wound deterioration, increase in infection rates, an increase in pain and discomfort, and an increase in treatment time and associated costs. The only thing it doesn't increase is quality of life. And I think that says a lot about an area that hasn't been of high focus for a long time. How does this happen? Well, the mechanism is that in acute wounds, exudate is fairly normal and it's part of the healing process. But once you move into the chronic phase of wound healing, you know, we have this toxic um, and high level of proteolytic enzymes that damage the stratum corneum, which Lexmi just talked about how important that is to keep that healthy. And in this patient, you can see she has um, maceration all along the edges. And again, it's interesting that uh, the pictures that we chose are showing not all of the peri wound skin, but I think that that's kind of um, a good indicator for that we should all need to look beyond just the wound bed itself. This gentleman has a venous leg ulcer, and you can tell that from the high exudate that wasn't able to be handled by the dressing, that his skin is, is exoriated all around. And really the, the key to management of peri wound is dressing decision-making 
holistic evaluation of how the dressing is functioning with that patient and in that wound. And, and then really adjusting fire because sometimes these wounds aren't going to react the same every day. And so um, that holistic approach of really questioning the patient and you know asking things like, when you wake up in the morning, are your sheets wet? And at the end of the day, is there um, moisture in your boot? And those kinds of statements during your holistic exam is really gonna bring you to the recognition of this problem. And we're gonna move forward to peristomal moisture associated dermatitis, which is one of my very favorite topics in the whole world. <laughs> And um, this is a picture of a nice stoma that has peristomal moisture associated dermatitis. And the peristomal skin, for the folks that are not necessarily as, um, don't work as much with stoma patients, it is the stoma that's around the skin. And it's amazing to me that in this article from Birch, that nearly three quarters of the people with the stoma experience skin problems. And, you know, when I read that, I was like, of course they do, because these are the people that I'm seeing in clinic. They're being admitted to the hospital for dehydration and cellulitis related to the fact that they weren't able to protect their skin from the effluent or the succus that was coming out of the stoma itself. And I can for sure tell you that this absolutely impairs their physical activity and their quality of life because they don't wanna go anywhere when they have leaking stool onto their skin. Their pouch um, that is supposed to contain that is adhesive. And what happens when you have a wet surface and you try and put something adhesive on it, obviously it doesn't stick. And so they can't stop the flow of the stool coming out of the stoma like you can, you know, coming out of your um, anus. But so it comes out all the time. And so they have to have a containment unit that always is there and is always solid. And of course, it takes um, a lot of cost to keep replacing a, a pouching system that is supposed to be worn for 48 to 72 hours. And if you're replacing it, you know, 10 times in a day, obviously, that's a very high cost. So how do you create a stoma? I am the complex abdomen specialist at our hospital. And so I'm in the operating room with our surgeons, you know, every day. And many times we're creating stomas. And I thought this was a nice illustration of how stomas should be created. And up till like the 1970s, this was not the situation. So what we're supposed to be doing is pulling the piece of bowel up past the fascia and through the skin and giving it some extra length, like an A, and then flipping it over kind of like a turtleneck and then anchoring it to the skin edge. Now I want you to see that that anchoring is truly a surgical incision. So you really need to think of a, a newly created stoma as a surgical incision and treat it as is. And so we wanna keep it clean and dry and away from contaminants, right? So this gentleman, I read his story and I was so taken um, about it. So when we create ostomies, the surgeons will say that we're brooking. And so finally one day I was like, what is brooking? And they were like, well, it's a technique where you bring the ball past the skin edge and flip it over and anchor it. Up till that point, they didn't do that. They would just anchor this, the bowel on the edge of the skin, almost like a sock, you know, hanging off of uh, the edge of the table. And so um, Dr. Brooke was very involved with the Crohn's and colitis patients, which many of them have stomas. And he had this thought, he's like, what if we actually brought the bowel past the skin edge? Cause it would be easier to pouch and not have as many leaks. And so he started this eversion technique. And then we now all call it the Brooke technique. So I just thought I would put that up. He practiced in Britain. And, um, and I think he retired in like the 1990s-ish. This is our team creating a new ileostomy. So you can see we're coming through the abdominal um, incision and then we actually core out a section of the skin. We bring the bowel past the skin edge and it's kind of tiny, but if you look close, you can see the sutures all around that stoma um, adhering it to the skin edge. There's different stoma types. There's the end stoma, which is the one that you just saw where it's just a standard brook. But I think that more common ones that have moisture associated problems is the loop ileostomies or loop stomas because they actually have, they bring the bowel up and they flip it over like a hump and then they sew it down so that the distal limb is still intact. 
And so the stool comes out of the main uh, lumen of the stoma, but many times the secondary hole, <laughs> the distal limb, is right at the skin edge. And that, that distal bowel, even though it's not active, it will allow mucus to slide up and it can help to loosen their pouching system. So these are probably the hardest patients to handle. And I would say most commonly they're placed in trauma situations and in um, cancer, in you know, colon cancer. And so these patients already have had a lot of stress in their lives. And then sometimes there's two stomas. One would be the active stoma that is connected directly to your stomach. The other one is a fistula, a mucus fistula that's the bowel is still intact, but it's just not active. Also, it depends on where it is on the gastrointestinal tract. So the jejunostomies and the ileostomies are on the small bowel. The, the effluent that comes out of the small bowel is liquidy. And then there's the colostomies, and it can be in the ascending transverse or descending colon that you can have it. And that the stool that comes out of that is much uh, more firm, and it doesn't have that watery component to it. And then there is urinary diversions. We're not really talking about that on this lecture, but just to, just to know that sometimes there's also urine that is being collected in the case where a bladder has to be removed. And this is just uh, examples of urostomy with stints in place. So back to our holistic approach and truly trying to recognize peristomal moisture associated skin damage. Um, a lot of times your patients come into clinic and no one wants to take a pouch off, right? They, you, you ask them how they're doing, you look at their pouch, but um, I think that it's very important to ask some pretty pointed questions like, do you, are you comfortable in your pouch? Does it hurt? Is there any itching? Is there soreness? And if so, um, do you have any pouch leaking? And have you noticed any blood in your pouch? And if their story is something that sounds like they're up many times at night, they've changed their pouch, you know, three times today already, and it's only two in the afternoon, um, that they're scared to go places because they're scared their pouch is going to leak. They bring an extra towel with them just in case. I mean, these are the things that you can recognize for peristomal moisture associated um, skin damage before you even take the pouch down, those kinds of pointed questions. And then mechanism of action. We talked about the fact that um, the digestive juices that come out of the um, ileostomies are more watery, they're more difficult to contain. And I always kind of think of it as like when, you know, the beaver comes up to the dam and pulls out that one little stick, which starts the, you know, the avalanche of the entire dam, right? And so even if there's just one little area that that watery um, digestive enzyme can get into, it'll start to erode that sticky pouching system. And in time it will come, it'll, you know, it'll come loose or it'll leak out the edge. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the, it doesn't happen to the entire area. Many times there's just a section that has um, frequent leaks because of uh, there's an incision that was nearby or a crease um, from where they had lost weight and it will start to leak through there, but then they'll have to change the entire pouch. And so the other areas where the pouch is really adhered well, gets those reported, uh, rep repetitive pouch changes. It, you know, you end up with skin damage just because of the fact that you're taking the pouch off, even though there was no leakage there. So Sometimes you have adhesive damage and you also have the moisture associated damage all around this poor little stoma that needs to be contained, you know, 24 hours a day because there's no control over it. You can't stop the output and you'll have patients that will tell you that they've been standing in the shower for three hours because they couldn't get a pouch back on because everything was so uh, watery, um, which is, is so heartbreaking. So I love um, anatomy and physiology. And so this is a great picture that shows why this is so hard. And so um, for example, we take out people's esophagus when they have esophageal cancer and we reroute their esophagus out their neck. And, um, and then you know months down the road, we'll reattach um, a section of bowel in place of the esophagus. So then they have a spit fistula and it sits right here at their neck and we put a pouch on it. So this diagram tells you that we make 1.5 liters of saliva a day, whether we're drinking or eating, 
that doesn't count. It's just how much we actually make in 20 in the 24 span. Then you add a half a liter of bile and maybe a couple liters of gastric secretions from your stomach and some pancreatic uh, enzymes, and you're at several liters a day. So these folks are fighting against several liters of output into a pouching system that maybe contains three to 400 milliliters at a time. And so you can imagine this is like a life-changing situation. And if their pouching system doesn't work because of the moisture associated skin damage, their quality of life can be almost zero. Also, Luxme talked to us a little about, about the acid mantle. And you can see that the pHs in the small intestine is not something that's going to help our acid mantle. And so I always think about the fact that um, when we're trying to protect the skin, we have to think about where on the bowel is the stoma because that's gonna, be, that's gonna have a difference in how um, healthy our skin can be. So obviously col uh, colostomies are the ones that are on the colon are a little bit more friendly to the skin. And so you see most of your problems with your ileostomy patients. So risk factors. Um, I think we all know what these are because we see them in our clinics and in the hospital, but definitely anyone that has some kind of a crease or a scar near the stoma, it's just a little uh, conduit for the watery fluid to come out of. Also, um, where they are, the stoma is located on the gastrointestinal tract. We kind of talked about that. Um, the degree of protrusion. So I work for a surgical team and, um, you know, I mark for patient stomas all the time. And, you know, sometimes we just don't have enough mesenteric artery and venous uh, webbing to get to the, the bowel to a protruding situation. And also, if you think about it this way, um, sometimes people lose or gain weight after they've had their stoma placed. And that definitely makes a difference because as they gain weight, they, I mean, they're, the stoma is still anchored at the fascial level. It kind of, you know, kind of starts to hide beneath the, you know, the tissue. So um, degree of protrusion is huge. And then the position of the lumen, I think one of the hardest, the lumen would be like where the stool comes out of and you want it to be pointing if the patient's laying down up towards the sky or um, straight at you. And the problem is that sometimes it'll point down towards their feet or off to one side. And so it's harder to contain that. And then incorrect ostomy device or wearing time, I think is the other, the next thing that we see fairly frequently. Like I said, when patients are initially uh, having their stomach created, it's one um, size. And then as they either, you know, become healthier after surgery and they lose all that extra fluid volume that we give them during surgery, um, their ostomy changes in size and in shape. And, and then also um, during your holistic, you know, approach, uh, when you're asking them about their skin around their stoma, one of the things that I like to ask them is like, how long do you wear your pouch? And some patients really like to try and wear it until it leaks. And we really try to encourage them to, you know, take it down every couple of days so that um, you can clean the skin and put on a fresh pouching system. Now I'm in Minnesota. It's one degree Fahrenheit here and um, we have several feet of snow. So there's not a lot of perspiration going on, but definitely anytime that you have patients that work hard, um, like a construction worker or someone that, you know, is very physically active, athletically, they may need to change their pouching systems more often just to take care of that. And then we talked about the high output stoma. If, if a patient's putting out liters and liters of stool in 24 hours, it's definitely gonna be much more difficult to contain than patients that don't. And in this series, we're really talking about recognition. And so um, rather than prevention and treatment, which is the next uh, series in this grouping. And so high output stoma is something that you want them to document. So I will send patients out with a piece of paper that says, you know, I want you to write down every time you dump your pouch and, you know, we can calculate volumes afterwards, but to really understand how much they're putting out is, it's, it's just so key. So um, in this first picture, you can see that the moisture associated skin injury is all around this poor little stoma that isn't protruding very well. You can see that there's a lot of product around there. Um, this is obviously a fairly new ostomy. You can still see the abdominal wound next to it. 
And then on our next set is um, what we call retracted stomas or a stoma that's in a crease. And you can just, from your mind's eye, you can tell how hard that might be to contain with a pouching system that you're trying to apply around it. On the next um, picture, this is an adhesive injury of a patient of mine that I put into a pouch that had some convexity. And it, it because the patient has a bit of a peristomal hernia, it actually gave it injury at the very base there. And you can definitely see how if I wouldn't have switched out that pouch into something more appropriate for this patient, we could have had much more damage down the road. In our next uh, picture, this is a patient that had pyoderma gangrenosum underneath the pouching system, which can happen very rapidly. And, you know, the only reason we really were keyed into it is that the patient was like, my stoma is really hurting, because you could see that almost all of that was underneath his uh, pouching system. The next picture is this mucocutaneous junction separation. And so you can see the stoma right in the middle of that wound and then the surgical uh, brooking and incision that was supposed to keep the skin right up to the, the bowel itself is all missing and is, has you know fallen away. So this, this is a very difficult pa uh, patient population to take care of. And, in the next series, we're going to talk about, you know, treatment of this, but just to kind of in your mind so you can kind of see what an MCJ separation looks like. And then this little kid um, was in my facility. He had a very big prolapsed um, colostomy and he had, um, you can kind of see he's using an irrigation pouching system rather than even a standard pouch because his prolapse was so long. So moving on to um, kind of more of an example of a patient that has had this kind of moisture associated skin damage around her ostomy. This video really is showing this, this nice woman who has a huge hernia around her stoma, which is fairly common, unfortunately, but she, she wouldn't leave the house because she couldn't keep a pouch on because from her eyesight, she couldn't see her um, pouching system. And so she would kind of guess where to put it. And you can see that the skin is so broke down. We actually had to put her into the hospital to kind of turn that around. And this definitely is very, very um, socially isolating. It brings patients to hospital readmissions and extended stays. So definitely your wear time and the appropriate product is so important. And for her, we just needed to give her a little stand up mirror. And we taught her how to put her pouching system on with the mirror on the table so that she could see where she was placing it. So sometimes just switching up the type of pouching is, um, it can help with this moisture associated injury. The next slide we're talking about fistulas, which are very similar to um, a stoma. It's, it's an outpouring of the bowel juice onto the skin that's not planned by a surgeon. So this is a patient that had a fistula on the left-hand side with the effluent kind of pouring into the skin folds. You can see she also has intertrigo and um, that mirrored image that you can see there. But just in a matter of a couple of days of therapy, we could turn that skin damage around and get her back into a pouching system. So this is a very treatable uh, problem to have. Perifistular moisture associated dermatitis looks very similar to the peristomal. So this nice lady has a whole bunch of uh, fistulas that are all exposed to the world. Um, and you can see she's got intertrigo, she's got um, moisture associated dermatitis. And so I thought that this article um, written by a colon and rectal doctor that lives just down the road from us um, she said, enteric output, especially succus from the proximal small bowel, so like an ileostomy, will erode skin in less than three hours. So these are definitely not patients that you want to, you know, wait till Monday to see or anything like that. This is kind of a, it's more of an emergent problem. And if you do have an uncontained stoma or fistula, you know, the sooner you can get that skin protected, either with the skin protectant or with a pouching system, the better for the patient. And then this last uh, video is a patient of mine. Her name is Marlis and she's 89 years old and she had, she has a urostomy, but she ended up having a small bowel obstruction and a fistula um, that she had a hard time with the poaching system. But I want you to listen to 
how she explains how her life lived when she had this moisture associated skin damage because she really didn't like her pouches um, to be changed. So I would like to introduce you to my dear friend, Marlis. I'm doing great. And, and what a, what a, I can't explain how, how wonderful it is to be free of that second, uh, that, that fistula that I had <laughs> and, and, and having that pouch. It had to be changed three times every week unless it leaked and then there was more changes and it was so painful. Many times I cried while it was being changed and sometimes it took an hour if that fistula was not behaving itself. Now I am free of it and it, and I don't have to worry about it. My my tummy feels better. I can I can go without worrying about it leaking. It's just great. I could not eat salads or popcorn. Now, can I eat popcorn by the way? Now I can eat anything I want and I'm I'm just about to, to try the popcorn without the without the husks in it. Right. And and the salad. Perfect. The, the chef salad. Have you had the chef salad? No, and I don't want to go into the hospital to have the chef salad here. And this is where they had the best chef salad. <laughs> it is very important to have a consistent person who knows how to do it. And uh, this gal spent an hour one day doing it because of the fistula was not behaving itself, and she kept on doing it. And uh, I couldn't have done it without her. Yeah. I couldn't have survived without her. I will celebrate my 90th birthday in uh, this year. The actual birthday is in November, but we're celebrating on Labor Day. My family is coming together. They tell me they have a Jeopardy game all, all in place, and we're also gonna auction off all the things that I can't use in my apartment now. <laughs> I have a crazy family. You would all love to be at the birthday party. I can tell you that. Oh, she is darling, my Marlis. Um, so finishing up my section here, I would just like to go over the holistic assessment is so, so important. And we kind of been talking about it all along um, about this peristomal skin damage, really talking to your patients, understanding um, how they're living their lives, what their, what their situation is at home, are they able to get the products that they need, what else is happening, and then really educating them on um, like patient diet. The diet that a patient with a stoma eats is very reflective in their pouching system, and so sometimes just changing up things like that can make a huge difference. And even th saying things like, you know, you can take a shower with your pouch on or with your pouch off and, you know, giving them an understanding of their own personal care around their stoma because hospital stays are so short these days and patients come in, they have this life changing event where they have a stoma, you know, all of a sudden, and then they go home. And so I think that really taking care of them as a whole person is so important. And then, like Luxemi talked about, a validated assessment tool for documentation, I think, is super important. And this DET scoring system is just an example of one. There's, there's definitely many out there to look at. And with that being said, um, I'm concluding this very first session, and I very much encourage you to come to uh, moisture, the Moisture Associated Skin Damage Part 2, which is the prevention and treatment, which will be super excited. I'm definitely going to log on and watch that. Um, and really, moisture plays such a key role in the damage of skin, the skin barrier by disrupt, disrupt, dis, ugh, disrupting the structure of the stratum corneum. Moisture associated skin damage comprises of, of the four clinical manifestations that we talked about today. And really, the difference is the type of moisture that's you know, making this damage. Early assessment, holistic approach to your patient, and that detection is the key to a proactive prevention program. Thank you ever so much, and I look forward to your questions. I look forward to seeing Lexmi and Ed and getting to it. So I'm going to turn it now over to Ed. And um... Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Lexmi. Um, just fantastic presentations. And to the viewers, thank you so many for your comments, your engagement, your questions. Um, guys, if you get a chance to look back at this event, some really kind words being said, so thank you very much. I'm aware time is short, so if it's okay with you too, can I crack on with the questions? Yeah. Um, so question one, let's start with Marianne. Um, Luxby, please interject with anything if you want. Um, how do you approach a patient with moisture-associated skin damage around a stoma or fist fistula that is too painful to touch? You know, that's a good question. And we talk about it a lot at where I work. And one of the um, easiest things to do that's a non-systemic 
um, method is that once the pouching system is off, we will lay a piece of gauze over the peristomal skin and put like a topical um, anesthetic. We use lidocaine uh, on ours, but there's probably other ones as well. Luxamy, uh, you're not, you don't do as much stoma work, but have you ever tried doing any kind of topical anesthetic to uh, other we, ones? Yeah, we will use lidocaine as well in wound sure. care when it's very painful. Yeah, yeah. You have to be careful around a peri wounds um, area because anything slippery, like if you use lidocaine gel, it's going to make it too slippery to put your pouch back on. So you always have to have that in the back of your mind. <laughs> but that's generally how we approach it. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. So question two from Geraldine. Um, thank you, Geraldine. Um, Luxemi, this is for you. How would moisture damage appear in darker skin tones in the early stages as redness wouldn't necessarily be present? Wonderful question. And thank you for that. Yes, as we know, we are very hot on dark skin tone. And what I would say to everybody participating in this today is don't, do not forget your senses, your touch, your feel, your observation. That's very, very important. Erythema cannot be present in dark skin tones, but you know your patient is incontinent and we know patient with incontinence are at risk. And that's why starting from your holistic assessment, check your skin daily. If you know if you can use your senses, touch and feel, you will know if the skin feels too hot to touch, or if it's not looking as healthy as other parts of the body. So just do not just focus on the redness. Brilliant, thank you, um, Marianne. Anything to add? Uh, no, I totally agree. I think the sense of touch and the and a trend. I always think that I see my patients as a trend. So if I looked at it, you know, yesterday and felt it yesterday and it was different today, that sense, I don't even know what you'd call that sense, but that's the sense that I use too. Yes. Brilliant, thank you. So I think the next question probably is for both of you, but we'll start with Marianne. Um, is the approach to MASD, IAD, the same across the world and should it be? Um, geez, I'm not sure. I think that, I think that, Probably the answer is no, because there is so many different cultural based um, changes depending on who you are working with. And I guess for an example is that we have a lot of folks um, in Minnesota that have come from all over the country. And sometimes you really need to understand their, their background, their culture, because some of the things that they're doing within their own family and their own lives is going to affect the skin itself. And Lexmi, I'm sure you probably have seen this as well. Absolutely. You concur? Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I completely agree with Marianne, but I would also want to say, yes, I'm hoping that it can be standardized because if somebody has got IED, we know the cause is incontinence. And if, if we focus at managing and getting the cause right using the appropriate pad for containment or barrier product, then the treatment should be same across the globe, yes. Brilliant, thank you guys. So question four and our last question, because I'm aware we're running out of time and people have given up precious time to be here in the first place. So Marianne, what technique do you suggest using to assist with the adherence of the pouching system when the skin around the stoma or fistula is weeping or denuded? Well, we have some really amazing new products. So after you gently clean the skin and allow it to dry as much as possible, um, there's some like a cryo accolade out there that you can use to put directly over that skin. So that's probably the easiest thing to do. And then you just have to talk to the patient and understand why this is happening and try and turn it around. But there is times we have to bring the patients into the hospital and rehydrate them and treat them for an underlying infection, whether it be fungal or bacterial. Brilliant. Thank you, and thank you both, um, not just for the questions, but the whole event. Um, I know how much work you guys have put in over the last few days and weeks, um, and months actually, so a huge thank you from me and the team. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed it, we've got two more events coming on this subject. We've got one on the 31st of March, Understanding MSD, which HMP are hosting on their amazing webinar platform. We've got one back on this Facebook Live platform on the 28th of April, we're managing MASD, so please feel free to join us. Um, we've got a fantastic MASD module on our website at woundcare-today.com. Uh, the link should appear now. Um, that's been translated into six different languages, so please go there for the module. 
the link for your certificate of attendance should now be ready. So please download that for your revalidation portfolios for CPD um, or any relevant structures you have in the regions you live in. Um, and the slides will be available for download um, in the next couple of days. Um, a couple of thank yous. Thank you again to Luxmi, to Marianne. Um, it's yeah. fantastic. Um, to my team at Wound Care Today, the teams at HMP and Mold Digital, I'm well aware of how much work you've put into this over the last few months. So a big thank you from me. Um, again, a huge thank you to 3M for your trust, your belief, and your commitment to um, this education. Um, as I said, these things just simply wouldn't happen without you guys. So thank you. And last but not least, to our audience, um, you healthcare professionals continue to inspire um, and humble me and the team. That's why we do what we do. Um, please stay safe, stay strong, have a fantastic evening. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you so much. And good afternoon. Thank you. Bye.